Good morning, everybody. We have a table set up in the back for the men's group. We have skeet shoot and the men's retreat coming up. And we kind of lost the sheets that we had been signing. Everybody's been signing, so we need. Hey, no, no, no. I didn't lose them. So you just need, you need everybody Misplaced. to, if you have signed up for either one or both, if you don't mind, just go back there, re-sign. And then if you're new to the church and you want to meet some of the men here, this would be a good time to do that. Okay? So there's two sheets in the back. Sometime between now and the end of the service, just go back there and sign up. Okay? Yeah. Can we just... Can we just talk about how you had one job? That was not my job. <laughs> Go ahead. Yay! Ed says it wasn't his job. But Thursday, Ed was up here going through the church trying to find the sheep. I'm just saying, not sure whose job that was. Uh, we got a couple other things. We're excited about all of that that's going on with the uh, the men's ministry, and also we wanted to mention uh, that we have uh, we have the Easter egg extravaganza this afternoon. So we got our big egg hunt this afternoon from two to four. So please invite people, and we'd love to see as many kids as possible. And uh, please get them out here this afternoon. It looks like, am I correct in saying it's probably going to be inside? Okay, the yeah. So, no matter what the weather is, we'll be here. Come down here first and we'll get it figured out. That's going to be this afternoon, and we're excited about that. Also, on Friday and Saturday, April 5th and 6th, the youth yard sale is coming up. So, if you want to donate some items for that, help them out, they would appreciate that. Um, they also. Uh, are looking for you to come and shop that day. So if you need to come and shop, they're going to be raising money to go on their uh, retreat this summer. Uh, this Wednesday night, March 20th, uh, we will have our normal men's and women's uh, ministry events, Bible studies, and children and youth will be here with their ministry uh, as well. Dinner's at 545 if you want to pre-sign up for that. And at 630, at 630, we will uh, have all of the ministry. So you don't have to come and eat. You can come to women's, children's, uh, men's, and youth. You can come do all that. And I promise you this. If you pre-sign up for the meal, we won't lose the list. Um, just going to say, if you pre-sign up for the meal, we won't lose the list. Kelly will take care of that in our office. So uh, last thing we wanted to mention, too, is coming up, uh, starting next week, is our Easter events here at Palmerdale, and that will start out with Palm Sunday. Uh, we'll have our regular services next week, but that's Palm Sunday, and we're excited about that at 8.30 and 10.45. And then Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday services are going to be during the Holy Week, and they're going to be at 6.30 in the sanctuary. Very important to take part in the event of the Holy Week and not just show up on Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday. And of course, Easter Sunday at 8.30 and 10.45, uh, we will celebrate our risen Savior. So all these things are coming up and we're very excited. And if you will, uh, for me, Alan, we're going to, um, they're fixing to begin worship again, but part of my sermon today is talking about what we believe and I want you guys to recite the Apostles' Creed with me just very quickly because it's going to go with my sermon today. We say it every few weeks in here anyway. So if you will state this with me today, this is our belief. This is what we say we believe. And remember always when we say the word Catholic, it means uh, the, the root word is universal. We say we stand with the universal church. So right after this, we're going to get back at worship. But I want you to uh, take a moment with me and state our beliefs. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. 
Amen. Hey, I deserved that. Last week, Kathy Middleton got her tongue tied, and I laughed at her, and now she's got me back. Uh, you get to say it. That is our beliefs. And as we begin the worship again, if our ushers will come forward, I'm going to say a blessing over our offering. And we're going to talk more about what we believe and what Jesus, uh, who Jesus says he is in our sermon today. Lord, we give you thanks for the opportunity to worship in your house this morning. And right now we ask that you would speak to us in all ways, that we would feel your presence in worship and we would feel your presence in the message. And God, all of these uh, tithes and donations this morning, everything that is given as a gift, let us take it to expand your kingdom throughout Palmerdale and the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
my life began.
two miles from Jerusalem, so many of the Jewish people of the region had come to Martha and Mary to console them over the loss of their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But when Mar but Mary was sitting in the house, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will grant you. Jesus replied, 
Your brother will come back to life again. Martha said, I know that he will come back to life again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even if he dies. And the one who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She replied, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who comes into the world. This is the word of the God. word of God for the people of God. Okay, that was great. Before I get in the sermon, I have to tell y'all about something terrible that happened up here Thursday night. And um, we're, we may show the video after the service, but it was filmed. There was a smoke machine that was placed behind the drum set. And uh, I was not aware of it until um, a certain person uh, named Nate sent me a picture of a sm smoky haze in the building and led me to believe there was problems. Um, panicking a little bit. But the video shows, uh, he had no idea, as, as, as Eric is back here playing the drums and the smoke engulfs him, he never quit playing. I could see nothing but his right hand. And he was still hitting, and he was completely covered in smoke like an 80s rock band. He just didn't have all the hair. And he was just going, and I just wanted to say, thank you for just being a professional, Eric. In the in midst of the smoke haze storm, Eric Hamilton never even, I mean, I don't even think he lost a note. It was very impressive. And uh, yes, and I think the only person that actually scared was Dennis McDuffie. Because later on, later in it, Dennis kept singing. Everybody quit singing. Dennis is singing by himself. And he turns around stunned when he looks. The electrician sees the smoke. There was a complete stunned moment for Dennis. It was pretty funny. I just, I, 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 that is not how I thought Eric would handle that situation. But he did a good job. In the 80s kid, right? When your dad smokes, you shut up. You sit in the back and shut up. You don't crack the window. The 80s are coming out for Eric Hamilton, but that was fun. This morning, we are concluding the I Am series that we've been going through, the Gospel of John. And it all leads to sort of this revelation that Jesus is telling us today. He, he was telling this to Martha. Uh, she was uh, the sister of Lazarus, and we're going to hear that. But it all kind of leads to this point of all these things that Jesus has said that he is, right? I am. I am. And he says this today, and I believe this is some of the most powerful words and one of the most powerful revelations that he makes in the Bible. And Jesus is coming to Bethany here. This is a small town. It's a small place, and it's uh, on the Mount of Olives. It's about two miles uh, from uh, Jerusalem. It's really just a little town. It's a little bitty town that most would have just considered is on the way to, to Jericho. It's not a big place, but a lot of things happen here. Uh, we believe Jesus ascended very close uh, at Pentecost to Bethany. It's very close. So we know that this is kind of an important place, and, and, and it's the home of Lazarus. It's the home of Martha and Mary, and this is an important place. And these are his friends. These are his friends. Jesus has shown that he has been with these people before and, and he finds out that Lazarus is sick and he's on his way there and, and, and he doesn't get there in time. At least in the opinion of Martha. He doesn't make it in time. He gets there and he's fixing to meet Martha again and, and see her. But her brother has been dead for four days. Her brother has been dead for four days. Now understand when people died during this time, they would put them in the tomb. They would bury them very quickly. So getting them into their burial uh, spaces uh, very quickly is not uncommon. But the four days matters because it is believed that the spirit can hover with the body for up to three days by some of these their spiritual beliefs and their custom, they would have believed it for three days 
And I, there's a lot of different reasons. There was some spiritual reasons to this. And, and, and to be frank, there was times they thought somebody might have passed and they didn't have all the medical technology we have now. And maybe they haven't. Uh, this was something that happened some, right? They, didn't, they wouldn't be able to know. And, and at the four-day mark, he's not coming back. All hope in this life is lost. And that's important. Hang on to that thought. All hope in this life is lost. Because how often in our lives do we have those moments where all hope seems to be lost? You ever been there? had that time and had that space, right? We've been there. So we know what that can feel. There's no hope left for this life. And many people, according to the scripture, had already come to uh, console Mary and Martha in verse 19. They are coming to give their condolences. You know, one of the things I've always been perplexed with is how we, in, in, in our society too, deal with mourning. You know, sometimes when you, I, I, I've really grown to appreciate the one day funeral. Everything's in the same day. I know it's good sometimes to have the viewing the night before because some people who can't come to work can come and pay their respects. But what I have found, and, and by the way, if that's how you choose to do it, I don't think anything negative about it, but what I do see is it sometimes causes extra grief and it's harder on the family. Like you go and you spend two or three hours at the church or the funeral home and then the next day you get up and you got to do it all over again, right? Like it's just a, it, it, you have to stay in that mode rather than moving forward and, and starting the grief process. I, I've begun to really see why a lot of families would rather have the viewing an hour or two before the funeral instead of doing it in two days because it's very hard. It's hard to be in those places and feel that pain, right? And, and when people are consoling you consistently, which is necessary and needed, it's still hard. So Mary and Martha are in that place and Lord only knows how long that would be in their society. People just come and knocking on the door. The news didn't travel as fast, so people would find out at different times a constant state of mourning and coming and reminding them that their brother has passed. And they are in that place, feeling that pain. And then we see verse 20. Let's look at it again. In verse 20, so when Martha heard that Jesus was coming... She went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. So we see that the two sisters are grieving differently. Number one, they're obviously different people. Grief, you know, there is no blueprint for grief and loss. That's one of the things I try to always tell people in a time of loss uh, as a pastor. There's no blueprint. There's, there's really, like, we pretend there is, but, but, you know, grief comes in waves and different situations and different settings. It, it all, it all, it, it's all different. And also each person is different. And we see here that uh, they are really, in my opinion, uh, this is a tutorial in grief because it's different for each person, us two. And, and despite it being different for Martha and Mary, Jesus loved them both and, and he would set out to heal them both in their grief. You need to know that. You need to note that little, that's a little underlining theme here is in your grief, in your hurt, in your suffering, Jesus wants to help you. No matter how you deal with your grief or how you process it or what type of person you are, there is no space where Jesus can't reach you. And he sort of shows that with these two women. Because Martha, she's, she's a woman of action, and it shows. She's, Jesus is coming. Her brother's passed away, and she's going to get up. I'm going to go meet him. That's what Martha says. She's going to go find Jesus. She's going to meet him. Mary appears to be a woman of quiet reflection, and she's, she's going to stay in the house. She doesn't have, maybe she doesn't have the energy in that moment, right? Her brother has passed away, and, and she's just going to sit right there, and she's going to wait 
she knows Jesus is coming. But they're different. And Jesus reaches both of them. Jesus reaches, reaches both of them. And then verses 21 and 22 happen as we follow along. But Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, notice that, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. God will give you, right? So we hear that. And I'm going to stop for just a second. I can hear a helicopter. Y'all hear it? Generally speaking, that's Lifesaver. And ever since I saw my grandfather lifted off in the Lifesaver, I can't see or hear a helicopter and not stop and pray for the people that might be involved. So is that okay with y'all if I say a quick prayer? Lord, we don't know what's going on, and maybe it's not. What, what it sounds like, but God, if that is lifesaver, we just want to lift up to you if someone's in pain, if someone's hurting, if someone uh, is in need of your care, God, I pray for them in this moment. I pray for their family, and I pray for all those medical personnel that might be taking care of them, Lord. Lord, we lift it to you, and we ask for your will to be done. Amen. It's just something I do. It's, it's a very, when I hear those helicopters, and, and it's, it's, it's a sign of a surreal feeling to me, and it brings up my own remembrance of what grief feels like and remembering that God reached me through it. So in, in hearing this, we, we see in verses 21 and 22, note that Martha had faith in Jesus to a point. To a point. I know that you could have healed my brother if only you had been here. Right? If you'd gotten here sooner. There is faith, but we've really not stepped all the way in. At least that's what it appears to me. So we see this happening. And, and, and no, this is not a, re, a rebuke. She's not fussing at Jesus, really. But it's words of grief and faith. You know, one of the hardest times sometimes to have faith is when you are in a time of grief and mourning and hurt. It's not the easiest. Now, it gives us a sense of, I don't know how people going through funerals that do not have a promise of those who have accepted Jesus do it. That, 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 that is a comforting force for us when we know someone is called upon the name of Jesus. That helps us to process and get through that time to know that we can one day be with them again. If we too do the same. So that is important. But at the same time, we still know that when you're in grief, when, when the world is hit, when life is hit and you're hurting, it's hard to hang on to your faith. It's tough in that moment, but it's necessary to hang on to your faith. So we see that and Martha remains confident Jesus could of healed Lazarus if he had just gotten there sooner. I want to tell you, I still marvel at Martha's faith in this moment, but it's still a limited faith. She's still, in a way, limiting Jesus. And Jesus responds... Right? It, it, because I will, he notes something about her. And he knows this about you and me too. We are all guilty to a point that sometimes we limit what Jesus can do for us. Not just in our eternal life, but right now. We sometimes limit what Jesus can do. And it baffles me because many times in Scripture... You know, Jesus would give opportunities for things to happen, but people sort of had to step into it in faith. I don't believe the man who sat on the mat, who could not walk, he said, get up and walk. The man didn't say, man, I've been sitting here for 40 years. I can't get up and walk. No, he got up. He, 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 he was a part of his own healing in a way because he, had, he stood up when he was told to stand up and try. 
And I, we see that is something that happens, but still there's many times that we could be healed or just have a better peace in our soul if we'd step out into our faith. Sometimes it's not a physical healing, but, but a spiritual healing. Sometimes it's, it's just that knowledge of what we believe in our faith and what it really means. I've been with people who were going through storms that amazed me. They were so steadfast in their faith. But we all can have a limited faith. We can all limit what Jesus does in our lives now and eternity. But Jesus responds in verse 23 and he says, Your brother will rise again. Your brother will rise again. And verse 24 shows that Martha has a belief in this because let's listen to that. In verse 24, Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. So she believes in that, right? And she should believe in that. It's in the Old Testament. Daniel chapter 12, verse 13. But as you do, go on your way until the end. You will rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. So this is an Old Testament thought. It was actually being taught by the Pharisees. Note here it was being taught by the Pharisees and not the Sadducees. They had some differences. But here's what it says in Acts 23. For the Sadducees say there is neither a resurrection nor angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So the Pharisees are teaching this. Martha's heard that. She's heard the words in Daniel. She believes this. She believes this. And, you know, Jesus has taught it as well. Uh, just uh, earlier in the book of John, I believe John chapter 4, for just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to those to whom he wishes. So... This is all out there. We understand that there's going to be uh, the resurrected life and that it's going to be something that can happen. I believe at this moment she, she truly believed, even before Jesus responded here in a minute, I believe Martha believed that he was someone who could point to that resurrection and help lead her to it. But she still had a little bit of limited belief. But in verse 25, Jesus responds some amazing words to Martha. He knows that she's looking through this through the Old Testament and what the Pharisees are teaching. He knows this. And in verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, shall he live again. Yet shall he live again. I am the resurrection and the life. When we hear those words, what does it mean? Because Jesus does not merely say that he will bring about the resurrection or even that he will cause it. By the way, both of those statements are true. They're still true, but Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus said he is those things. Of course, he can cause it. He can bring it about. But Jesus is saying that he is those things. He's actually saying that resurrection from the dead and eternal life in, this, in, in eternity along uh, with living life abundantly with fellowship with God is tied to him. So living life in a fulfilling way and having that key to eternity is tied directly to him and that it can only be found in relationship with him. That's what Jesus is saying. That's who he's saying he is. This is what he's saying he's capable of. Jesus is the resurrection for the dead, the hope for eternal life. Jesus is the life for the living, the the purpose for meaningful life you know we talk about 
uh, Lazarus or Jesus or all these people that would be put in tombs, right? And they both walked out of their tombs. By the way, Lazarus returned to it at some point. He died twice. <laughs> we, he's with Jesus now. I believe that. But he still had a temporary spot in this world. But you know, many times when, when I'm talking about living life abundantly with meaning, we're living in our own tombs, people. We, we are living in, in our despair, in our anxiety, in our fear, in our hurt. We're living with our grief. And it, it, it slows us. We're in our tombs right now. And I'm telling you, Jesus is calling. He doesn't want you to stay in that tomb. Not for eternal life. He wants you to be in heaven in eternity, but right now you are called to live in fellowship with the living God. That's not some oasis that we see way off just when we pass from this life. It's a promise we're supposed to have now. But when, you know, these bad times hit, how will we respond? Verse 26, continuing on through the scripture, verse 26 and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Jesus asked Martha. He's revealing some great things to her. And then he says to her, now listen. Then he says to her, do you believe? This is Martha whose brother just died. She's going through a hard time. It never says if Martha or Mary were married. I don't know if they had husbands. It doesn't say their father's living. Their, their life is connected to a male heir. They have to have a male, somebody, a brother, a father, a son, a, 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 a husband to look after them. And if they don't, their existence is, is, is in question. That Their place in society is, is harder. So she's going through a lot potentially, not just the loss of her brother. And she is in grief. She's in that place. And verse 27 is her response. Verse 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. That's her response. That's her response when she is in grief, when she is hurting. When her future is in question, that's her response when her belief system that she's been taught by the Pharisees is being changed a little bit. When Jesus says, hey, I'm actually not just going to cause these things, but I am these things. She's learning on the fly here. Martha believes what Jesus is saying. And I want to be honest with you. I don't know that she can fully comprehend it still. And that's okay. I don't think any of us can ever fully comprehend Jesus in God. That's why this whole time that we're in this world in life, we are moving toward Jesus. You, listen, entire sanctification takes your entire life. You are always on the journey where you can be growing closer to God. And she's on this journey. And even though I don't think she fully grasped it all yet, I do believe she believes what he's saying. I do believe she believes he is who he says he is. She can feel that presence. She's seen him. Seen him. Jesus says he is those things. And in this case, she is feeling his presence. So we see that Martha believes in Jesus in good times and in bad. And, you know, we, we said earlier, we read the creed, the Apostles' Creed, and we've been through all the I am's of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Do we believe these things is my question to you. Do you believe these things when the rubber meets the road? Do you believe these things? And, and that's really what the question comes to, right? You know, right now is one of my favorite times of the year. It's March Madness. I love Easter too, by the way. I do got my UAB town. 
I love basketball and I love March Madness because there's all these tournaments and there's a lot of these small little teams and leagues and the only way they can go and be a part of the big dance is by winning the little conference tournament, right? Or you've not had the best regular season and you got to win the automatic bid by winning, right? And every time, last night I watched, uh, I've never watched Long Beach State play basketball before, but I'm addicted to watching basketball in these tournaments. Because they're playing, they're, everything is on the line. Season ends or they're going to go to the big dance and be on the national stage. Five days ago, Long Beach State fired their basketball coach. They said, you can finish the season, but you're done, brother. They won four games in four days and they're dancing. And after the game was over, the coach with tears in his eyes said, we believed. We believed that we could do this. If no one else believed in us, in this room, we believed. What a testament, right? You listen, anytime these basketball teams win at this time of year, you'll always hear a coach say, we believed. Right? Belief. It's powerful. You can't do anything without it. And when times get tough, when your backs are against the wall in this world, what do you believe? Does your faith stand through that? Do you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life when, when everything is going against you? Do you believe that if you were in that helicopter we heard earlier? Do you believe that when you're at the funeral home saying goodbye? Do you believe that when everything in your world's fall apart and your job's gone and this has happened and all? You know, that's really what, what, what it comes down to. Because we read the creed, but do we believe it? In that way, when times are hard, you know, I remember when Stephen was stoned to death and he's dying there and he's still crying out to God. He's praying for the people who were murdering him because his belief was that strong. And I believe in part because that is one of the things that changed Saul to Paul after Jesus opened his eyes and did all this. He saw Stephen, he stood there and he saw Stephen being stoned to death and he said, this is good. That was the mentality of the people throwing the stones and Stephen is still praying for him. As the instruments of his death strike him. That is belief. And I know where Stephen is today. And guess what? The world is a better place because he was in it. Because of his testimony. The disciples, if you go back and look, most of them did not, they did not have good deaths. Crucified, crucified upside down, spears through the heart. They did not have good deaths, but they were willing to stand on their belief. What do we believe? It's going to help you get through the hard times. Martha believed in the face of her grief and her brother's death. And what happened to her brother a few verses later? Belief is a powerful thing. This morning, do we believe in hard times? That's my challenge to you as we get into the Easter season. We've heard all the I am's of Jesus. As the band gets ready to come back up here, what do we believe? And, and sometimes we just... Our lack of belief keeps us from knowing what we're capable of. One of the things I think is beautiful in nature is there are certain types of eagles, not all of them, and there's a, there is one myth about them that they'll pick up their young and then fly real high and drop them. That's not what they do. But some of the eagles will nudge their young out of the nest. And they start to fall because they haven't started to fly. And then the mama eagle will, at the last second, if they don't fly, swoop in and catch them and take them back up to the nest. We'll have to do it over again. And sometimes they have to do it over and over until the eagle feels, figures out, the baby eagle f figures out that it could fly the entire time if it tried. 
I think Jesus is doing that to us all the time. We're going through hard times. We're going through good times. We're going through everything in between. And Jesus is trying to show us, I want to give you abundant life. I want you to have the promise of eternity. And no matter how hard this world gets, right before we hit the ground sometimes, he swoops right in and catches us. We have that. But I'm going to tell you this morning, that no matter what you're going through or what time you're in in your, in, in your life, in this world, you're going to fall. Sometimes we're going to forget that God helps us fly. Sometimes we're going to forget that Jesus will come in and catch us when the things are, uh, the storms are, are, are just uh, railing against us. But if you live in communion with Jesus, and in that direct fellowship that it provides through God, no matter the circumstances, no matter what is going on, you will get through if you believe these words as Martha did. And I'm going to ask you this. I want you to bow your head for just a second. Who are you in hard times? What is your faith? Be honest. When, when, when things are tough, who are you? Because it's not the easy times that define us. It's the hard times that define you. Who are you in the hard times? How's your faith then? And I want you to think of something I'm always telling you. Model after Jesus. Who was Jesus in hard times? Who was Jesus in Holy Week when they turned on him? When they denied him? When they spit on him? When they doubted him? Who was Jesus? He remained who he always was. And this morning, I want to pray to you. Maybe you need to accept him for the first time. Maybe you need to turn your hard times over to Jesus. Maybe you need to give that grief that you've been hanging on to. I don't know what it is, but you need to believe the words that we state when we say the creed, when we say the Lord's Prayer, when we read Scripture. And this morning, I want to ask you to turn all of it over to him. God, we may be here this morning. We may need to give our life to you for the first time. We may need to request baptism or step out into church membership. God, we may need to step into a new calling that you're putting on our life. God, we may just need to leave the pain and hurt of this world behind and let you swoop in and catch us. God, this morning, let this, these people, if they're watching at home or here in the building with us, let them mind you, God, and let them turn to you and realize that you are the resurrection and the life in all times. And you will help us through every season of this life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stop!
Stand with me for a second. We uh, have a little bit of business to take care of. Is we have for the second straight week two folks who are coming to uh, join the church with us, and it's Eric and Lori Robertson. And uh, most of you have had the pleasure of meeting them, and uh, they they have been attending here for a little over a year and have been a consistent part of our family. And they have been led to make it official. And, and I want you to know that it, God was really at work because Lori, the only two people she knew in this church was Phil Stewart and Mike Wynn. <laughs> Praise the Lord, they still came. <laughs> but these are two great people of God, and we are extremely blessed to have you guys making this official. And uh, as I've already asked you, but I will again, have you accepted uh, Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And have you been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Yes. Well, that leaves that we will take part in these vows now with the local church. If y'all want to turn and take part with me, do you promise as professing and baptized disciples of Jesus, according to the grace given you to keep God's holy will and commandments and walk in the same all of the days of your life as a faithful member of Christ's holy church? As a member of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Brothers and sisters, I commend to your love and care those whom we this day receive into the membership of this congregation. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. And as I reminded you last week, we now all renew our vows. And you're making a vow to them as well that you're going to lift them up, pray for them. And you're actually remaking this vow to every person who is a member of this church. And I invite you to take part with us now. We rejoice to recognize you as members of Christ's Holy Church and bid you welcome to this Methodist congregation. With you, we renew our vows to uphold it by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that surrounded by steadfast love, you may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, bless, preserve, and keep you now and evermore. Amen. Let's welcome them in officially. We're excited to have them both. Absolutely. Uh, would you snap a photo for me? And Maddie Sayer, will you come up and get a microphone? She's, Maddie's going to close us with the Lord's Prayer tonight, or this morning. Well, you will. 
You can do it tonight, too. You can do it tonight, too. Let me get a picture real quick. Make sure that you all uh, welcome Eric and Lord. Did you say Robertson? No, Robertson. He told me right before we came up here, he said it's Robertson. I knew it, but I'm going to pick on him now. Welcome Eric and Lori to our church family after this. And Maddie, if you will, close us in prayer. Would you please join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, the hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 